Hello and welcome back to episode 38 of the Boxing Social Podcast in association with Betfred and Sporf. With me, your host, Rob Tebbett. Just before we get started, as always, I'd like to remind everybody to please like, comment and subscribe. Turn your notifications on for more boxing content. Now that's out of the way, very special guest this week. It's taken me three years to get you on, Eddie. But welcome, welcome to the feel, podcast. Feel like, do you remember Smith & Jones or Hale & Pace? <laughs> I feel like this is, this is what it is. Not sure which one you are, but... Uh... Yeah, you're a bit slimmer these days. You know, I never thought there'd be a stage where I was actually larger than you, and now that's here. You know, well, so I think it's kind of it's gone in it, it peaks and troughs. Troughs is probably not the right way to words for somebody who eats like a pig, like myself. <laughs> <laughs> but like when I came into boxing, and it's actually one of the things that we're going to talk about here. It's kind of the lifestyle and maintaining living in boxing and kind of working in boxing. Obviously, we do very different jobs, but still, I think anybody who works in boxing kind of works. 25 hours a day, eight mm. days a week, sort of 258, kind of treading on the trademark there. But yeah, how do you kind of not go mental, I guess, Eddie, in working in, working in boxing to the to the degree that you do as well? Because I think you're certainly one of, if not the busiest person that I come into contact with. I think if you love what you do and you've got a passion for what you do, it doesn't feel like a job, firstly. Um, I couldn't imagine doing anything else other than being involved in boxing. And there are times when you get tired and, you know, there are times where you don't really want to speak to people. And that's probably the hardest thing of what I do is speaking because there is no rest, you know. So I come up to a press conference. I'm doing interviews the whole way up. You've seen me. I do the press conference and then I'll do all of them, really. I mean, there might be times where I have to duck off, but generally I'll do another 20 or 30 interviews saying the same things. Then I'll get back in the car and I'll have to finish off doing ones that I haven't done. And then you get home and then you've got, a, and then your wife and the kids want to have a conversation. And, you know, there's times where you just want to just almost say, leave me alone. Just, I want to be alone, mm. you know, in a room. And I'm actually comfortable alone. Do you know what I mean? I'm one of those people where I could actually live out of a suitcase going from hotel to hotel to hotel. The hardest thing is balancing work life with private life and personal life. Because that's difficult when you have a missus and you have children and, and you mustn't disregard your role in life in that respect with the passion you have for your work. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I don't want to be that guy because I spent a lot of my childhood, my dad was never around. You know, he was away for three or four weeks at a time in Asia doing the snooker tours and, you know, then he got into boxing. I never felt a void in my childhood, but also it sits in the mind that, you know, I don't just want to be on the road, on the road, missing my kids grow up. So the balance is difficult because you've got to be switched on when you get home. You know, if I could just go home and go to my room and just sleep for two days, lovely. But I can't. I've got to go to the park. Then I've got to go and take him on the trampolines. Then I've got to do the school run in the morning, all mixed in with getting up to Manchester, getting back, you know. So mm. that, that's, that's the hardest thing. But I haven't cracked up yet. You know, I'm, I've never felt say down I've never felt like you know exhausted and on my knees I felt knackered and training's important eating well's important all those things are lessons for everybody it doesn't matter what you do really you've got to look after yourself um, because there's stresses in, in all forms of life but what I try and do just to close off on this question otherwise I'd be here for three hours is I try and realise how lucky I am to do what I do you know there was a run well this is the end of the run coming up it's been seven or eight shows in four or five weeks. And I was at, in Vegas and I was tired and, and New York was cold and I didn't feel great. And I just thought to myself, hang on, you're, you're about to promote at Madison Square Garden and then you're flying to Vegas to promote MGM Grand, two back-to-back -back fights of the year. Like, how lucky are you? People would give their right arm to do what I do. Do you know what I mean? So uh, at the same time, I'm not expecting people to say, are you all right, Eddie? Are you feeling okay? Are you tired? But yeah, I am at times, but I'm also very lucky to do what I do. And I'm at the very top of what I do. There's no promoter doing this worldwide. I know I get stick and all that, but break it down. What British promoter has ever done what I've done? Forget the UK iconic events, AJ and stuff like that, globally. And that's the challenge for me now because I needed something like that. And that was one of the reasons behind the move to DAZN because they were the people that can give me this opportunity to be a global powerhouse. And that's something that's never been done before. 
You mentioned your dad, and like, I mean, we see your dad now when we come down to mass schools, and he's still in there every day. Mm. Obviously, he was, congratulations. Now, ba Barry Hearn, MBE, mm. people who haven't seen that. OBE. Be, OBE, even bigger. Your pardon, yeah, even yeah, yeah. bigger. Um, well, first and foremost, what was that like, seeing your old man kind of, yeah, down there with the with the royal family? Yeah, with, it's good for a, for a, you know, for a guy out of Dagenham. I mean, two very different upbringings, me and him, but two very similar mindsets. Yeah. Um, he was born in Dagenham in a council house, shared a room with his sister, put a sheet down the middle of the room. Dad was a bus driver, died at 43. Mum, uh, my nan was a cleaner, you know, and, and they're a proper East End family, you know. Started making money. Um, I was born, lived in a great house, had everything a kid could dream of having, flew all over the world with him, watching fights and stuff like that. But... You know, sort of generational wealth, it's that first generation, it's a lot easier to to maintain that working class ethic, right? My kids, two daughters, and I, I love to spoil them, but at the same time, it gets harder through the generations to maintain that hustle. Mm. And what I have is bundles of hustle. Like you will never out hustle me, you will never outwork me. Not the brightest, not a maths genius, but I can sell, I can talk, I've got pure common sense and street smart and you won't out hustle me. That's di that's an di interesting look from someone that comes from a wealthy family and I have to thank my dad and mostly my mum for that, who is, hopefully she's not listening to this, but a, a hard-nosed East End woman, right, who would actually walk a couple of miles to get a packet of ham that was actually cheaper in another shop, right? True sort of values, understanding about money, the value of money, where my dad's just a little bit more flary, you know? So I think that growing up, I I was, I look back at myself as a kid, not, ooh, you know, mm. flash Harry, horrible, 14, 15, 16, flying around watching Naz in Vegas, with Eubank down in Brighton, you know, Bruno, Herbie Hyde fighting Riddick Bow in Vegas. I'm all, I'm bringing belts in. And I'm, I spent a lot of my early life telling people I was Barry Hearn's son, mm. you know? And then as you get a little bit older, you don't really want to tell them that anymore because you don't want to be Barry Hearn's son or known as Barry Hearn's son. And that's a big drive behind what I do is my achieving my own success, stepping out of those shadows. You actually see that from some of the young fighters now. Connor Ben's a good example. Mm. Chris Eubank Jr. Very proud of our parents, but really, you wanna, you wanna be something on your own. And to do that, it's very difficult when you've got a successful father. So, you know, he deserves everything from that OBE, services to sport. No one, no promoter has, um, you know, dedicated his life to sport like he has in, in terms of providing opportunities for athletes. That's the thing that makes him happiest is seeing normal working class people change their lives through sport. And, and that's a really important mindset to have as you grow into a, a, a big business, which becomes a big business. And sometimes that can take away from the beauty and the dream of changing your life through sport because it becomes money focused. Mm. And we like to, you know, we say, um, he always says, no passion, no point. That's you know, my, my BBC podcast. And that's our sort of family, which means if you don't care, if it doesn't mean something to you, if it doesn't make you warm inside or cry, when, when you see something like that, not for us. He's obviously had his health problems over the years. Um, recently, mm. had a, he had his second heart attack mm. of his life. What was that like for you? Kind of somebody who's, you know, you were Barry Hearn's son. Mm. You're still Barry Hearn's son, but you mm. know what I mean. What was that like for you? And do you worry that that could potentially one day happen to you? Because I imagine you're always on the go. You've yeah, always got we, we, we have a history of, of uh, heart disease in the family, which is never good when you're six foot five and 17 stone. Um, my, my granddad, his dad, died at 44. His dad died at 43. And my dad had a heart attack at, in his early 40s as well. All smokers. I don't smoke, which is... Good news, mm. um, but I do have a lot of stress in my life, and I do, you know, probably my diet, you know, my cholesterol is probably quite high, and but it is quite hard. Tell you, <laughs> tell you I've had it tested, <laughs> so things have changed. When my granddad had a heart attack, as my dad tells me, they'd send him home, and they'd said sit in that chair for two weeks and don't move. He actually died um, 
when he was chasing his daughter, just tiggling her, like joking around in the house, run upstairs, chasing her, had a heart attack and died. And um, my dad's first heart attack, I'd actually been out to a nightclub in London, I think I was about 19, and I got home and I put the plug in the wall to charge my phone, I remember it like it was yesterday, you know, and it was 23 years ago. And he came out of his bedroom and he said, what was that noise? I said, oh sorry, I was just putting my, my phone in. All right, okay, went to sleep, got woken up, however, hour or what it was like, and he was pacing up and down the, the, the corridor. And my mum, who, you know, going back to her, she said, stop overreacting, you know, have some milk. All right, it's probably indigestion. Now, milk is probably the worst thing you can have when you're having a heart attack. <laughs> then I just remember him sitting in a chair and just holding his chest saying, ah, oh, you know, rocking backwards and forwards. Anyway, I called an ambulance, the ambulance come. We went to the hospital. Um, and yeah, I was in the ambulance room and it's, you know, he's got the oxygen on and you start to think, Jesus, you know, this could be all over here. Um, stabilised him, went to the the hospital and it was the funniest moment when my mum was on one side of the bed and the doctor said, because my dad used to smoke 40 a day, right? But gave up years ago, but really didn't really give up. But mm. according to my mum, gave up. <laughs> so the doctor says, Mr. Hearn, I have to ask you, do you smoke? And my mum goes, no, he doesn't smoke. And the doctor went, Mrs. Hearn, I just, you know, he doesn't smoke, he gave up years ago. Mr. Hearn, do you smoke? Well, I mean, every now and again, and, the, and the shit, what? And the thing's just going beep, 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 like this. So he had a, a blocked artery, had an angiogram, sorted that out. And then this year, um, back in, in, no, sorry, last year it was actually, mm. in March, had another blocked artery, very minor heart attack this time around, although ne never great, and uh, had another blocked artery. So right now, all his arteries are clear and good. Um, and then I gave him COVID about two months later, which was a horrendous time because, you know, I'm thinking, he just come off a heart attack, he could he could die here, and I've given it to him, all right? So that, that wasn't great. But we're also big believers as a family, and I know this might sound a little bit brutal, but what will be will be. Do you know what I mean? Mm. And stay healthy, get yourself checked. I mean, I, I always, you know, I go in and I had a heart scan the other day because, you know, my dad, will. he's one of those guys. Get it checked, get it... I'm one of those guys that might leave it. Yeah. He's not. Get it checked. You've got the resources. Go and get it checked. Had it checked. All good so far. Touch wood. But at the same time, I do what I do. I worry about it later. Now, you might live to regret that. I might live sit there one day, you know, about to snuff it and say, I should have really not done as much or mm. taken care of myself a little bit more. But I believe in living in the moment and doing what, what's right now. And this is right for me. You know, this is what I love to do. I wouldn't want to do anything else. And I know it sounds selfish. Hopefully my missus isn't listening to this. If it shortens my life, it shortens my life. Do you know what I mean? Mm. But I, li I live a great life, an exciting life. And I'll leave a life that's remembered rather than one that's, you know, he went and bought a house in the country and you never saw him again. I can't live like that. It doesn't drive me. So... You want to live as long as possible. You want to be as healthy as possible, but also you've got to do what you've got to do. And this is, the family business is something that you can't fuck with me on because it means too much. So it is what it is. If it kills me, it kills me. I know that sounds, you know. No, I get and, what you're and, saying. And again, though. like if, if my missus hears this, she will say, you're, you're an idiot. Mm. But that's how I feel. I'm not telling you how I feel. Mm. That's why I won't be beaten because it means too much. It's not a job. It's not... Oh, if it works out, it works out. It's not no. It's everything. You know, like a fighter wants to go on and win a world title or, or, or unify or be undisputed. It's everything to them. This is everything to me. So, you know, um, this has been good, Rob. Feels like a good counselling session. Yeah, I think I can get you Forgot to lie down recorded. on the couch. Yeah. Forgot <laughs> this is recorded. <laughs> I'll be getting contacted from a lot of doctors. Um, oh, what's your thing? I'm, I'm, we're worried about you. Um I know the the family business me, means an awful mm. lot to you, but could you ever see yourself doing something else? Yeah. Like going in, because you've spoke about it in the past. We've spoken about it. I don't know if you remember, we did an interview in New York, fight mm. week before Joshua Ruiz. And it's one of my favorite interviews because the start of it, I actually spoke to somebody about this yesterday. So I was thinking, oh, God, I'm coming on the pod. I always speak to you. So I spoke to you yesterday for 20 minutes mm. about, you know, the card that's on this weekend and, and all of that sort of stuff. But obviously, you know, don't do this mm. very often. I remember that interview where, I said that was prime Hearn that week. That was mm. Hearn, 
New York. We got yeah. Joshua headline in Madison Square Garden. Remember, we had the, like the mixer at the start of the week, and then later on that day, because he pulled from pillar to post and mm. what have you, we finished off the interview. And let's say it was less prime Hearn mm -hmm. then. It was probably it was, what were the drinks that you were having? Destroyers. Oh yeah, 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 destroyers. And uh, I remember you kind of saying then about you know I don't necessarily want to be doing this forever, but. Mm. How long do you think that'll be? You've just done this thing with the zone. That's mm. not going to be something that you're going to be able to walk away oh, from yeah. anytime soon, is it? It's not. I mean, I'm, I won't be in boxing forever, but I'm not talking three, five years. Mm. I mean, I don't want to be. I saw what boxing did to my dad, right? Don't forget, I spent a huge amount of time as a kid in his study, right? He was on the phone all night, and I would sit on the floor. I'd be throwing a cricket ball in the air, waiting for him to finish, so we could have a game of football, have a game of table tennis, have a game of darts. And all I heard was arguments. Don King on the phone, Bob Arum on the phone, Frank Warren on the phone. Arguments all the time. And he was uh, he had a bad temper. He had no um, ability to sort of stay, you know, he, he's short, short fuse all the time. And he, when he stopped boxing, it changed his life. Right, and he looks at me now and talks to me now, and he looks at me. He goes, oh, "I remember," I, you know, as if to say, oh, "I don't envy you, son." Mm. You know, I remember that. So you look at Warren, you look at Aram. What are you doing, right? Bob Aram is ninety, yeah, and he is angry, pissed off, you know, but he loves it. That's his life. I don't want to be that guy. I'm forty-two. Right, maybe fifty an hour. I don't know, but again, you don't. The problem is with these people. What my dad did was something that actually shows more balls than anything. He went, "I'm out. See you later. I don't think boxing's actually that hot anymore. I'm not really enjoying it. I'm going to go and take over darts. I think it's much easier. Bye." And people sort of goaded him at the time. Warren still says, "Oh, he walked away from boxing." And mate, one, look at the company. Two, look at his life. Three, look at the happiness. You know, these are things. So you have to be big enough to walk away. The problem is with walking away, you let people win. You imagine now if I turn around tomorrow and I went, I've made a decision. It's a personal decision. I'm out of boxing. See you, everyone. I mean, like, I know boxing goes on, but I'd like to think that's quite, you know, like big news. Mm. But you let everyone win. So if it's Warren or if it's, you know, Boxer now or if it's like all of a sudden, wow, what a result. He's gone. And I don't want, I, it's the, I'm a, I'm a failed athlete, really, because I would have wanted to be a sportsman. But what I do is the next best thing. But I grew up in sport and this is a problem with kids today. There's not enough sport going into the younger generation that teaches them about winning, losing, respect, discipline, hard work. These are all things that come through sport, particularly through boxing, by the way, and this is why I'm such a big advocate of grassroots boxing. Mm. So this business to me is a sport, right? I have to win. So when we talk about doing other things, I, you know, what appeals to me right now about other things is I love to create content and I love, to, I love live events. So music is something that inevitably I will move into. Football, possibly. We looked at that in terms of the agency side. I like content. I like compelling programming, right? So we were really the first promoters here in the UK to start working on shoulder programming and, you know, across our behind the scenes and stuff like that. But I love the stuff, Drive to Survive, you know, the the Jordan documentary. Watch the Tiger Woods one on HBO. That's that's more of an area, and, and through Matra Media, we're there now, really, to start doing that. But that's something that appeals to me more, and maybe doing other stuff. You know, I, I like to I like to be involved in concepts and projects, and but boxing, you know, from my first show, which I think might have been Gary Mason at Cliffs Pavilion when I was seven or eight. It's just been a huge part of my life and nothing makes me feel like boxing. With my dad stepping back, I'm now chairman of the, the darts, you know, involved with a snooker on the ball. And I have a job to do there, but nothing makes me feel the way that boxing does. Good and bad, you know. You mentioned um, Warren, Aram, mm. those guys. I've spoken to you about them in the past and heard your opinion. What do you think those guys think of you? 
What do you think Frank Warren? I'd like to think Bob they Aaron? I'd like I'd like to think they respect me in terms of my ability and what I've done. They they don't like me. I mean that's that's very clear. And I don't expect them to like me because they don't know me. And the the perception that I give off to them in that environment is probably arrogance, loud mouth, smarmy, you know. Um and that's that's my job, really. I like to wind people up. You know, I like to fuck with their heads a little bit as well at the same time. Um but one thing that will always last the standard time is reputation and integrity of business. If you speak to fighters we represent, you will find it very difficult to get a bad word said about us in terms of honouring an agreement, paying people on time, you know, and, and that's not something that sits across all promoters, yeah. you know, and that's not a dig at Frank and Bob because f f uh, Bob particularly has a very strong business there in, in America. So I think that, um, like I say to my dad sometimes, can you imagine if I was around when you were promoting, what you'd think of me? And he just laughs and goes, oh, fuck you, I would, <laughs> I would absolutely hate you. You know, but that's, that's quite flattering in a way as well. So I think one of, I won't say it's one of my mistakes, but there are certain people that I don't have great relationships with, that it might be more beneficial if I did. Do you understand? So, mm. and there's only really two, and that's Heyman. Heyman is one, and two is Aaron. But then at the same time, we do deals with Aaron. Yeah. If, if Bob wants to get a deal done, it doesn't matter. The one thing I say about Bob: if Bob hates you, but there's a deal to be done, not a problem. The deal's getting done. With Warren and with Heyman, particularly, it don't. It doesn't matter. They'd rather. Lose an opportunity for their fighter, lose money, then do a deal with me. And then, from a public facing point of view, you know, you see Frank come out, we should have, you know, here's, let's have a lunch, and here's the fights we need to make. Honestly, it don't really work like that. The hatred is deep. And it just, that you know, they would rather lose. Now, I say to PBC all the time, Louis de Cubis, who's a you know, good friend yeah. of mine, mate. There's so much business we can make. And you know what? It would save you money. It would be financially beneficial for your business. Great opportunities for your fighters. They can't bring themselves to do it because it's kind of... Le in America, they don't want to let me in. It's too late. I'm in. I've infiltrated. I'm, I'm still got miles to go. But they don't want me to get progress in America. They don't want me to be successful in America. And I, w I wouldn't. You know, if, it, if an American promoter came over here, I wouldn't want them to be successful. And I would stand on, you know, and try and defend our ground. So it's only natural. But I think they feel that if they give, if they, you know, they want to cut off my oxygen. That's what they want to do. You mentioned Heyman there. There'll be people who are watching this who are obviously familiar with the name Al Heyman. Obviously, we don't see, don't see anywhere near as much of Al Heyman as we do you, Mr. Hearn. Yeah. Um, what is it that, that you've, I say that, that you've done. Why did the relationship, or why has the relationship gone the way it's gone? Was it the Joshua Wilder stuff? Because there was a time where you were getting matchroom fighters on PBC mm. shows. Like I, I actually popped up uh, the other day. Lena Delaby, of course, with Mayor of Promotions, who wants to fight you now, apparently, yeah. um, was on camera. I think it was one of Coogan's videos saying, you're doing a great job. You're smashing it. Yeah. You're this, that, and the other. And now, all of a sudden, you're, you're the enemy. Because, was it, because I came to America. But there was no kind of thing between you and Heyman. Was, do you think the Wilder negotiations? Probably. Because that's yeah, yeah, probably. But they don't like anything. You know, when you look at Leonard Ellaby, who says you know he's going to knock me out when he gets... Like, if you actually look at what I've said, people say to me, wow, what did you do to Leonard? And I said, I said that the Haney-Diaz fight was a much bigger fight than Diaz against... Uh, Javante against Cruz. Basically, that was it. You know. So... They don't like, Heyman doesn't like promoters. You know, he runs the PBC, but he uses smaller promoters mm. because he doesn't want a promoter to have power, right? So he uses guys who work for him, basically. Tom right? Brown. Tom Brown, yeah. these sort of people. And, and you know, he doesn't like promoters to come. I mean, I mean Al is very, he's a quiet man. You never see him. He's hardly ever at a show versus me who's everywhere, loud mouth, at every show. Do you know what I mean? Front and centre. But when people say, oh, that Eddie Hearn, you know, he's always up there. I'm the promoter. That's my job. What do you want me to do? Hide backstage and not do any interviews or not tell everyone how great this show is or not drive tickets or not drive pay-per-views or subscription. I need to be everywhere. 
you know, it's going back to your, your question off, off podcast earlier. Which promote great promoter, Don King. Now, everything around what he did, we don't like or agree with, but great promoter. Every interview, you know, the flags, walking up and down the street. This is a guy who would probably go up and down on an open top bus with a megaphone mm. telling the whole city about the fight. That's a promoter. Do you know what I mean? So these guys, um, I think the Wilder Joshua stuff, I remember meeting Al, I've met Al three or four times. The first time was about Carl Froch and Julio Cesar Chavez and, and the second time. When he wants something, he's a, he's a real gent. Then the tables really turned for Wilder Joshua and I met him in New York with Shelley Finkel and he wasn't pleasant. And it was because I was very vocal about that fight. you know. But there's two reasons for that. One, you're building a fight and two, you're trying to put pressure on. Sometimes that can work against you. you know. And that, that was a messy situation mm. because I felt like they never really wanted the fight. You know, All of a sudden, we get an email from Deontay Wilder Deontay Wilder at hotmail.com or something like that going, all right, Anthony, I'll give you 50 million for the fight. Let us know. That was it. So I was like, what is that? So I went back and said, yeah, no problem. Like, could you tell me where this money's coming from? Where's the fight? What? what? And we never got, a, or send us a draft contract. Oh no, you have to accept the deal first before we send you a draft contract. I'm like, what? And it was just a game. Accept the deal, send us a draft contract. We don't sign it. Oh, he's gone back on his word. It was just... The whole thing was a complete mess, and it did it did sort of poison the relationship a little bit between us and PBC. Yeah, I mean, I remember it. I remember doing interviews with you about mm. it every Fun other though, week. Isn't it? Yeah, well, I mean, yeah, but I mean, you can see why. I guess you're kind of what I would call, or what the industry would call, a new age promoter. Mm. You've, you're very digitally savvy. You're always mm. out there. You're always kind of pushing people on socials and stuff. You mentioned Al Heyman, who's worked with Drake, who's worked with all mm. of these massive stars. Then you've got Shelley Finkel. Which you had another name for him, which Shirley, Winkle. Shirley Winkle. That drove him mental. Yeah, I, I, can you see that though? If if your dad was around back then and somebody was calling, I don't know, well, this is difficult because Winkle is obviously a, but anyway, uh, your somebody was calling your dad, I don't know, Larry Burns or something yeah, like that, but, but taking the piss out of him, you could see how yeah, your, your old man it, wouldn't like personally that. Personally, find it quite amusing. But like, we've got a couple of things. Like, I was with Richard Chafer the other day, mm. and someone said to me who knows him, says, "Look, you know, I get on with Richard now." But he didn't really like the way that you used to do the impressions of him. I, I don't think, you know. <laughs> but it was never, but I don't know. I mean, I'd like to think that part of the reason that people might like me is that I am an open book. You know what I mean? And, and the problem with doing all these interviews is you're going to say something that's going to piss someone off. Like, you won't let me get away from a press conference or a weigh-in or a fight night without sticking a camera in my face for 20 or 30 minutes, mm. right? So sometimes might be a little bit tired or pissed off or, you know, in a, in a bit of a jovial mood. So when I say things like, you know, Richard Schaefer, like, oh, get your popcorn ready, here we go. Like, I'm not, I, I don't, I like Rich, like I have no animosity to him at all. And when I said, oh, an old Shelley Finkel and, you know, but then said, oh, I spoke to old Shirley Winkle. And then all of a sudden I'm getting messages going, Shirley Winkle, and people actually, one someone called it him it on a media call by mistake, but you shouldn't take things. I think one of the best advice is don't take yourself too seriously. I don't. Do you know what I mean? If someone started calling me whatever big chunky fat promoter from the UK, loudmouth, it's no problem. But some people, there is a big problem I have between sarcasm and the way that's digested in the UK versus yeah. the way it's digested in America because it doesn't really work over there and I have found that out going back to Frank now obviously I remember all of the stuff the who wants it the posters yeah, yeah, and yeah. stuff that came out look realistically you were never going to get that but would it have not worked better for British boxing if you'd have had that lunch cool uh, the lunch the lunch does it not show willingness yeah I mean actually we did arrange a lunch but I got COVID but that was how long ago uh, October about so yeah, over but, a year ago. but the problem is a lot of those fights that, that actually yeah, yeah were, no of like, course yeah I, but know, I get that to be honest like would you have looked at it as you're helping Frank out of course you know I, I, but would, and you, again, would it have not helped your business in some way not really doing those fights not really I mean I remember the list what was it 
Dubois against Dillian White, which at the time obviously yeah, it was a ridiculous like, fight. Yeah. yeah, I mean the only one that stood out was Boatsy against Yard. I think one of the other ones was Andre. I mean, I, again, forget the poster. Yeah. But so and I'm, I think one of them was Andre against Williams, which was a mandatory. Which, and I made yeah. it yeah. Right, on, on yeah. my show. So, but it's not arrogance when I say like, look, anyone can go to company's house and look at individual businesses. Like we're in absolute prime position, and. There's things that go on behind the scenes, you know, emails going to people and trying to stop things and disrupt things. And that's what happens every day for us. Not so much now, but during that period. So you see that and I arrange a meeting. And then at the same time, someone from Frank Warren's office is emailing the board saying they want to see David Diamante's flight details because they think he didn't quarantine for the, they think he was a day short on his quarantine. And it's like, so we have to send the board to do it, and he was fine. But it's like, what are you doing? Like, and it's niggling, and it's it's quite personal. Like for the same things you talk about, our Heyman and stuff like that. You know, it, that that's this is more personal because they're trying to disrupt business. Not, I don't mind you call me what you want, but actually to go above and beyond and write three or four page emails and legal letters and like you, you guys don't see that. So in the end, you think to yourself, why would I want to have a meeting with you? Why would I want? I don't like the way you do business. So why do I want to do business with you? All right, I get the good for British fight fans and stuff like that, but you know, at the end of the day, you've got to focus on your own business and, and, and we like what we're doing. Is that, yeah, I, I completely get that. I understand from, from I mean, obviously I'm a business owner of a different, mm. completely different scale, obviously, but working for the best of the sport and the fighters in general, because you've spoken openly about kind of, let's call it right, monopolizing boxing, mm. being the Dana White, so to speak, of boxing, having the UFC of boxing. Are you not going to have to have relationships with promoters? or Because it seems to me like you're quite very much a smash the door down. Mm. We're here. We got this. We got that. You, there's the video with Coogan. That's always on no context turn. Mm. Too old, too this, out of the way. Yeah, we're coming yeah, through yeah. in the middle. Is that the way to go if you want to kind of monopolize the whole sport? Mm. Is that not going to bite? Is Has it not bitten you in Do the Do you know ass? what, Rob? It's my way. Right. So I will always, you know, I will always like to be remembered for being me and Mm. being real and not being a snide. And that's me. So I agree with you. When I went into America, a mistake that I made was coming out and saying, I'm going to I'm going to be number one. We're going to smash you guys to pieces. But that's me, British bulldog going in there Mm. and being me. I weren't going to go in and be sneaky or snidey and say, yeah, um, no, we're just looking to, you know, just come in soft launch and then, you know, make friends and work together for the good of the industry because I'm lying. So I'm looking to take complete control of boxing globally. That's my plan. I'm telling you my plan. Right now, maybe it might be brighter or, you know, more, you know, strategic to actually go in quietly. And that's just not me. You know what I mean? So, and I wouldn't be me. I wouldn't be as big as we are or as successful as we are without that that bullish attitude to go in and try and dominate. In terms of relationships, yeah, I think it would be more beneficial if we had a better relationship with PBC for both of us, Yeah. right? The relationship with Top Rank is fine. We make fights all the time with Top Rank, right? So Golden Boy are on the same platform. We'd like to do more, but you know, we can pick up the phone and make any fight with them. So it's not really like, we've got bad relationships where we can't make fights. PBC is the only one where I feel that they just don't want to do business with us. So hopefully that will change. But, you know, if we if we went in tippy-toeing around, it's not, it's just not our, it's not fun. You know, I want to, I want to upset people. I want to disrupt the business. That's what DAZN have done, you know, better than anybody is to go in and disrupt the marketplace and that's what we are with disruptors but we're also long-term players we're not fly by night just pop in and yeah and if it doesn't work out so you know and, and people have said to me before don't you think that maybe when you went into america should have just got under the radar a little bit nah not for me okay final question because we've got to get over to the weigh-in Correct. parkage is or two live and exclusive on the zone there you go ready thank you mate um tyson fury mm. uh I never thought he was coming back. You mm-hmm. obviously never thought he was coming back or you thought he was going to come back. And, you know, we, we've heard kind of inklings and, and what have you about the meeting that you had, the mm. infamous meeting, and we saw him in Monaco that time. Yeah. Regret? Uh, I ne- honestly never regret anything. And, and I think 
it's hard because AJ is, you know, one, he's a very close friend of mine. Two, I put everything into it. Like, and to have those guys together, like I always wanted those guys to fight and AJ to be our guy and going, I could just imagine beating him. And with Tyson, I flew him out to Monaco. He was 26. I mean, Massive. he was sitting where you are. He was sweating. And I just thought to myself, you ain't ever fighting again. And the plan was to have two easy fights. By that, we meant Sefer Seferi and like those kind of guys, which he had. Yeah, right. But then have a step up and fight, you know, uh, Manuel Char or someone like this. Then, And I was thinking, now, if I would have known that he would have gone Sefer Seferi, somebody else, and then Deontay Wilder, I would have been all over it. But I have a, a huge amount of respect for Tyson Fury. People sometimes get it mixed because sometimes he'll say this and I'll say that. But this is a guy that done certainly what most couldn't do, or probably I couldn't do, which was to get himself from a physical position where he was finished, done, to not just fight him fit, but to go and win the World Heavyweight Championship. So some people will always feel that I speak, you know, I never really say anything bad about Tyson Fury. Sometimes I, I haven't thought he was the best heavyweight in the world. He's gone on to prove to me that right now, on paper, he's the number one heavyweight in the world. And I don't mind saying it. I respect people that go on and achieve success and greatness. Um, he is on a, another team, I guess, if you could call it that. But, you know, he, he proved me wrong. And I don't have regret. Would I like to be involved in Fury Wilder? Of course. You know, that's my bread and butter. That's what I live for. But at the same time, you know, I know we have Dillian White and Chisora and these kind of people, but AJ, you know, it, it would have been a really awkward situation to try and have both. But I, I, you know, you can't say you wouldn't want to respect a fighter like and a character like Tyson Fury because, you know, he's become a big star. Okay, last one. It's taken me three and a half years or there thereabouts to get you on the podcast. If we do another podcast in three and a half years or 10 mm. years time, where do you think you're going to be? What's the plan for 10 years? Obviously, 10 you, years. you're into this mm. deal with the zone, which as kind of we've both alluded to there. That is a long term project. Mm -hmm. That mm -hmm. is something that you're going to have to build from here to here. Similarly, well, I know you've kind of taken on the family business, mm. but again, boxing wise, it has grown. 10 years time. What's Eddie Hearn going to be doing? 10 years time. I'd probably like to sort of... Um take a step back from business and sit across different projects. But I know this is going to sound really weird, but some of the, the, the greatest feelings I get is to see the younger generation progress through sport. So like even my two daughters play cricket and we go to Billericay Cricket Club, which is amazing on a Friday night. There's like hundreds of kids, different age groups. And I play cricket to a good standard and I will go into a net and I will just, sit with the you know and, and watch the the kids bowl bat and just try and coach a little bit and and i know it sounds really weird but that sometimes motivates me to see young kids like i'd like to do more in the community i'd like to try and become a little bit like use the power that i've i've sort of built to create better decisions for the community and for for politicians and for them to understand what sport can do for the younger generation. Like, you know, because you're around boxing, people don't realise what a, an amateur boxing club can do for a community. Those kids in there are not getting into trouble, right? They're going in there, they're training most days, they're exhausted when they come out, they're letting out their frustrations, they're, they're understanding that regimental lifestyle that you need sometimes to get on. You need to be able to say, yes, sir. Do you know what I mean? And kids don't do that now. When you have a mentor, you have a coach, or you have a boss, there's nothing wrong with having that regimental lifestyle. Because And the people in there, who, by the way, all do it for nothing mm. and are all volunteers, they're the guys that can change these kids' lives because kids now have no respect, no manners, no discipline. They get everything they want, regardless of, of actually, most of the time, the background of their parents. Because it's just, it's just easier to give a kid something. I'm guilty of that all the time. But I just feel that sport is so important to the community and building the foundations for an individual that that's something I would like to do. Because you know we've we've built a great business and we don't I don't I don't have a lifestyle that means I have to work. You know I don't 
yeah, okay, if I can nick a little private jet cheap to fly somewhere short, it's nice. I don't fly around the world private. I don't have yachts. I don't have houses all around. I'm not interested. You know what I mean? I've got a nice house, lovely family. It's what I do. But to actually make a difference, like I feel like I've made a difference to sport, but how do you make a difference in the community and in the country? That would be something that would, would actually motivate me more than any amount of money. Okay, well, we look forward to that. We'll catch up again in 10 years' time, and we'll do this again. You'll see me on the pads down Brentwood ABC. <laughs> yeah, that'd be a good sight. Uh, Eddie Hearn, thanks very much for popping by uh, in, in the middle of a busy, busy fight week. We've both got to go now, otherwise we'll be late for the weigh-in. Mm. Don't want to get told off, but thank you very much. We got there in the end. We've got you on the Boxing Social podcast. From me, Rob Tebbett, from him, Eddie Hearn. Thanks very much for stopping by. We'll catch up with you soon. <laughs>